you give it up for all of our campuses today, specifically our online. Our pastors are preaching this today at their campuses. But uh, come on, you can do better now. Give it up for online today, man. We have people literally watching from different parts of the world. We love you. Just slap the screen, do something, share, and, um, and make, let God use you in your sphere, man. And you, we've all been given a place of influence. And I know you don't know all those people who are friends with you on social media. And, uh, and they really, if they click a button, it doesn't mean they like you. They don't know you. If they know, knew you, would they like you? I don't know. But, uh, but, but share that, and man, let God use you today here in this message. But come on, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me today to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. <laughs> While you're turning there, there was this boss, and he started complaining at a staff meeting that he never got any respect. He just, the people working for him just didn't respect him. So he went out, and he got a sign called, I'm the boss, and he taped it on his door. So he went off to lunch, he came back. Man, there was another sign. There was a handwritten sign underneath that sign. It said, your wife called. She wants you to bring home her sign. <laughs> and well, You know, we've, we've stepped into the uh, month of February. is always uh, the celebration of Black History Month. I'm so thankful for how far we've come. We still, got a long, we, we still got a ways to go. I was just with Pastor Miles McPherson for the last couple of days out at a conference. Miles pastors The Rock in Anaheim, California, and or Pasadena. It's one of those California towns. Everybody can serve him. Anyway, there. I'm sorry. Uh, and he's just written a book. And if you were a part of the conference, I, I want to encourage you. We did a panel one day, not only with Will Ford, but uh, Choco de Jesus. We did it with uh, Pastor Jay Stewart, myself, and, um, and, it was in, and Robert Stewart, Stearns. And it was an incredible uh, time talking about what is the answer to the racial divide in our nation. And God has always put his answer in his church. And he's always put it in a place where it's reachable if we're willing to walk it out. And, and so I've been with him and hearing his teaching and I, I, got, I got his book. But what an amazing uh, leader that God has raised up. And then, but having Will Ford with us a few weeks ago and that story, if you've still not heard that story, go online from two Sundays ago, three Sundays ago and listen to that. It will impact your life. So we're, we're here in, in Black History Month. But last month we celebrated the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. When he was in jail in Birmingham for a nonviolent protest against segregation in 1963. It was actually on April 16th, 1963, King wrote his famous letter from the Birmingham jail. In it, he wrote, a state, he wrote statements like this. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He wrote, anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. This letter is considered by most, by, by so many, the most important pillar of the civil rights movement. Letters can and have changed the course of history. What we're going to be going through the next few weeks are letters, the last letters that we know of that Jesus gave that would be canonized. In this book called Revelation, this apocalyptic, remember, it, it means an unveiling, it means a revelation. That's why it's called Revel the book of Revelation. These seven churches that represent a spiritual thermostat as to where they were and actually represent where we are today. Notice he, he is speaking to the church as a whole. You'll find this. And how some individuals represent the entire church. Now think on that a moment. How there are some 
individuals represent, that represent the entire church. In Ephesus, we'll find today they left their first love. Smyrna was persecuted. Pergamum compromised with the world. Thyatira was immoral with a remnant of good. Sardis, the reputation of being alive but dead. Only a remnant remains. Philadelphia, weak, but the, you've kept the word of God. Laodicea, increased with material goods and have need of nothing because it feels it needs nothing. These seven letters that all began with an encounter with Jesus in a way John had never experienced. He saw Jesus in his glory. He was not a savior, a baby in a manger. He was not a savior on a cross. It was a king in his glory, the king that would come in. The one who, uh, Isaiah would, uh, uh, David would say, who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. That you're able to lift up your heads, O oh, your gates, and even lift them up your everlasting doors because the king of glory comes in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So lift up your heads, O oh, you gates, even lift them up your everlasting doors because the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of the armies of heaven and earth, the Lord of hosts, he's the king of glory. He sees him. He's told, blessed is the one who reads aloud these words of prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it, take it to heart, what is written in it, because the time is near. I want to speak to you of these next few moments, and I, I'm believing for a miracle, for time to stand still. If not, you'll be here till the second service. But in chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, it's important that I read this, highlight this. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work, your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles but are not. You've discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Well, that's strong. What, an, what, a, what a compliment. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at the first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back, repent to me, and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Your, your influence, your light will be removed. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches, to everyone who is victorious. I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Lord, bless I pray today you would allow me to speak your heart. I need you. I can't do this in myself. I depend on you. Holy Spirit, speak to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to remind you to the angel. Angel in this passage in the Greek, it actually means pastor or overseer of the church. And he says, I'm the one walking in the midst. I'm the one who walks among you. What it means in the Greek, it is right in the very center. To be in the heart of a thing. Jesus was actually not only in the heart of it, he was walking circles around this ch his church. Looking at everything and then walking into the heart of the church, seeing motive, seeing reason for where they were. And get this, it's where he is all the time. He said, I'm going to build a church the gates of hell will not prevail against. His church is bigger than this church. We're only a microcosm of his church. 
But what we do in the church, how we represent his church, how we represent the one who gave the church really matters and how we reflect him in the community and the pedestal he put us on to be a reflection of Jesus. He said, I know you. It means to examine, to fully view. It's to know it from personal observation. He, he's not sending a representation. He's coming himself. He, he doesn't need somebody to tell him about his church. He already knows everything and everyone that's in his church. He said, I know your works, which has to do with your actions, your beliefs, your conduct. I, I want you to hear, here's the church of Ephesus. I want you to know that this was actually the largest city. Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, was the largest city in the Roman province of Asia Minor. It was the third largest city in the known world at the time. It was Rome's New York City. It was an economic center. It was one of the primary seaports of the ancient world, and it was known for its immorality. Immorality that came from idol worship combined, and it was a very wicked, evil place. People would actually travel there and go to worship all these gods of the Romans. The silversmiths that were there made a lot of money because of the household idols that they would fashion and sell them when they came into the port. And the moment they did, they, they came into this this beautiful array of columns, over 200 columns on each side, these stone granite columns, and, and the whole paveway, it would kind of glisten in the sun when you read it. They had the main arena that was up ahead, so you would get off these ships, walk into this beautiful colonnade. People would travel there to worship. They would travel there. The most famous temple was Diana. And one of the, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because of its size and because of its splendor. But yet it was in Ephesus that became a revival city. In the book of Acts, in chapters 18 and 19, Paul returned from his third missionary journey to establish this church. I'm just going to give you a little background. Is that okay? We're going somewhere. And yet in the book of Acts, the greatest revival that's recorded, the most powerful church, was at Ephesus. And it broke out. It was, it was such a powerful move of God. Paul stayed there for three years, along with Aquila and Priscilla. They had come from Corinth. They, they had slipped over on his third missionary journey, on, and, and they just hung out there. On his second one, then he came back on his third. And they, this revival breaks out. If you look at it truly, Paul planted the church. Timothy, his young son in the Lord that you read in First and Second Timothy, he is teaching a son but training a soldier. He is, he is actually preparing him. Timothy was one of the youngest pastors we have in church history in that day, and he pastored the church at Ephesus. It's believed the church had grown to over 25,000 people by the time young Timothy got there. That's why Paul's dealing with him, why he's got ulcers in his stomach. He's battling lust. He's battling what is a real leader. It's where you get the definition of a, of a deacon and an elder. He's trying to establish leaders. He's dealing with people. People are people and people, I don't care if they live then or they live now. He's, he's, he's got ulcers. And Paul's saying, it's okay, bro. Everything's all right. You know, just, just chill out. It's going to be all right. But so Timothy pastored the church, and John the Beloved poured into it. Actually, it is believed that it was at Ephesus when that, Ephesus went, that John brought Mary, the mother of Jesus, and lived there. He was then taken ultimately on the Isle of Patmos. He was during Nero because Nero has burned Rome. He's trying to put it, paste it on the, Christ, the Christians that they did it. He's wanting to rebuild it and name it after himself. Persecution rises against the church massively. We talked last week how Paul now is on an he was on an Isle of Patmos when he's having this vision, but he would ultimately go back to Ephesus and be an apostle, a covering. He would be a caring man there that would die in his early 90s in Ephesus. So, man, they had some leadership. We know more about the church of Ephesus than we know about any other church in the New Testament. We watch the church in Ephesus grow. You'll find it in Acts 18 and 19. We watch the 
Ephesus be encouraged with one of the most amazing books of Christ in us, the hope of glory, this mystery of the book of Ephesians. We watch Ephesus get challenged in First and Second Timothy. We watch Ephesus get rebuked in First, Second, and Third John. He's writing to them. We watch Ephesus get addressed by Jesus himself in, this, in Revelation 2. Here again, one of the most powerful churches, influential churches in the book of Acts. Because if you came to Ephesus, it, mean, it was a crossroad of the society of the world at that moment. That whatever was happening in Ephesus would spread around the world. It was renounced, their idol worship to Diana. It was one that they were so devoted to Jesus at one time that they burned all their magic books and everything related to the false goddess of Diana. And in Acts chapter 19, it says that 50,000 silver coins worth of books were burned. If you put it in today's price, over $5 million worth of demonic witchcraft books, they brought to the place and burned them. It was also the house, the headquarters of Demetrius, of, of, of Artemis, which the other god, this goddess of the Ephesians. You'll find the story there. I encourage you. I don't have time today. Go and read chapters 18 and 19 of Acts. And now Jesus is speaking. He said, I want you to write this letter to the church at Ephesus. Let them know I'm holding them in my right hand and I'm walking with them. And know that you can't live in darkness when I'm the one walking with you. And he gives them this commendation. I'm going to go through this really fast. He, he hears what he commends them on. He says, he affirms that their faithfulness. He said, you're faithful. You work hard. You labor. You, you, you're no, your perseverance is, 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 is matchless. You, you can't bear those who claim that they're one thing and they're living another thing. He said, you even hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This was a hard-working church. They had not fainted. They hadn't given up. They were actually doing everything they were doing in the name of Jesus. They've continually been responsible. They were patient. They've been working. They've done it all in his name. Man, what? you would think this is the model church. You put those churches in America right now, they explode, they expand. That's the new wave of church growth. Man, they, it's everything about it. They're expanding, they're moving, they're grooving, they're a machine, man. They got their systems down. They've got everything. They are rolling. They know how to plant. They know how to do this. Just add water. We've already figured it all out, and we're doing it all in the name of Jesus. Everything. We got this happening. It's the model church. But then he brings a correction. And he says in verse 4, but I have this complaint. In the Greek, it means you got to strike against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. In the structure of the Greek here, here's actually what the Greek is saying. Because your love, the first one, you've let it slip through your fingers. Your early love, when you first came to me, it had a romantic feel to it. It, it had this passion associated with it. You were so thankful what I delivered you from. I brought you out of all these idol worship things. I, I got you out of these demonic influences. I broke the power of darkness off your life. You were so passionate for me. It motivated you with everything else you did. You know, you remember, remember what it was, and here we're at. You, you don't want to miss the EXO conference because I'm, I'm going to, you know, I, I don't wait for this once a year or our marriage conference to get closer to my, but it does cause you to, to go back and remember. Yeah, you know, I, first love is amazing love. See, I remember when I first met her. She actually, that was her. That actually, when, when she was done with me, when she was finished with me, she set that picture on my nightstand in my bedroom. She was going to Washington. She was sick of my shenanigans, couldn't make up my mind, 
that I wanted to be with her and I wanted to, I wanted to grow old with her. And so I was just flip-flopping here and there. And man, I went, she flew out to Seattle and I was there. She had, I had st stayed in the basement because we traveled with Karen Wheaton back at those days. And so she, we, we couldn't get to Florence. So she stayed, my mom let her stay in my room and I had to stay in, of course, in the basement. And she left the next day, but she left that picture next to my bed and took the dress she had worn the night before at the service and sprayed it with channel. No, I mean, Chanel. No, what was it? I see, I don't remember the scent. Halston. Oh, yes, it was Halston. It was definitely Halston. Oh, you need to buy some more of that, baby. I remember Halston. And it messed with me. I would wake up in the night and turn over. I'm going, dear Jesus. And I'd go to my closet and smell that perfume. That turned into the next picture. That took us there. That's first love. I mean, that's messed up love. That's, I, listen, I didn't forget to call her ever. I couldn't wait to call her. We talked constantly. We didn't have beepers. We didn't have cell phones. I'd pull over on the side of the phone, pop in some quarters. Here's a quarter. Call someone who cares. And I would just, we'd run out of things to say. And we just, I'd just hear her breathe. Knowing she was on the other line. Come on, I mean, that's first, that's Jesus. I mean, come on, man. I mean, these, these were days of our beginnings. This was, I mean, that's how they came. I mean, from that, those first looks, all these, these kids started coming. Said, so you needed another hobby. No, it was a great hobby. And that's Miami Vice days, if you didn't figure that one out. That's, what was Jesus saying to this church? He said, you forgot what it was like. And in the Greek, it doesn't mean he said you have fallen and you, you have left your first love. Left does not mean to abandon it means to lose. In the Greek, it actually means you have lost your grip on this love that was so precious. And now you have been reduced to routine machinery, just trekking through, doing, doing, doing. Yet the reason why and the passion for has slipped through your fingers. He commended them for their hard work and their labor. But there was something missing. There was a flaw. There was a trip point. There was something they had lost the grip of. See, the first and greatest commandment that Jesus said was you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, strength, and soul. The second is like to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no negotiation in that. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on feeling. It's based on decision, choice. See, I chose her. When I chose her and I made covenant with her, God sealed the choice. That's why the enemy fights this choice. He's fought your choices. Maybe other choices were made, and maybe now you're in another relationship. Maybe it's blended family. It's happened. I understand that. God, God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate the divorcee. Never forget that. So God wants to strengthen what remains. He wants to so strengthen you that what happened before never happens again. I just thought I'd throw that in there. The third thing is his call, and he said this, remember. Stop and remember. 
Scott so gave, man, what a nugget he gave a while ago of worship. Remember means reattach yourself to the things that you once did that fueled the fire of passion for him and his presence. Remember the level of dedication you had for me. Remember, I owned your money. Remember, I owned your time. Everything was mine. Think of me. Recall it. Rehearse it. Remember it. I don't care what you got to do. Pull out the photo albums. Get your phone up. Whatever you got to do, go back to the beginning. Remember what it was like. Let me stir in you those moments you found me. And repent. Turn around from where you're going and just come back to me. That's what it means. Change your mind. It has nothing to do with your emotion. Emotions are not required for repentance. But it's making a decision. Turn around, go back, do the first works. That's what he's saying to them. Is anybody with me today? Go back to the place of passion. Twice it says, Jesus says to them, repent, repent. Anytime you see, you see something that is being, it is being said again, there's an emphasis he's wanting to make and he's saying to them, I'm calling you to turn around because it's dangerous where you are. You can be known for all the things you do and trip up and forget who you are. Then he does something that I thought was, I've always thought, I never understood it to this week, honestly. Then he recalls something to them. In the middle of telling them, remember, re- repent, and return, he brings this in in verse 6. He says, but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Now, wait, whoa, whoa. Jesus has just told us he hates something. That's a strong word. We, we never use that word in our family. We never let our kids use, well, I hate that. No, 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 you're not going to use that word. You may dislike it, but you ain't, no. Hate is a strong, strong word. But it actually, it, it is used in a positive way of what Jesus is saying. Because you're going to find out he's not hating the Nicolaitans. He hates two things, their deeds and their doctrine. It's very specific. In that passage, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. In verse 14 and 15 and 16, he's going to address again another church, but here's what he's going to say. You hate the doctrine. There's a doctrine that I hate. See, we're not called to hate anybody. We can disagree, but it doesn't mean we're to hate. What we're experiencing in our nation right now is a deep-seated Hatred. I don't care what side you think you're on, what you pick. You can be Republican, Democrat, Libertarian. I don't care what you are. If there is a deep seat of hate, there is, there is something that goes much deeper than just a dialogue or a disagreement. When it gets into the seededness of our spirit of hate, it produces ultimately a violent response and reaction and a complete disdain that no Ability to come together can ever happen. But Jesus said, I don't hate them, but I hate what they do and what they teach. Here's what the word hate means here in the Greek. It is missio, and it means to hate, to harbor, to find utterly repulsive, a deep-seated animosity. Intense hatred, repugnance. It's something that causes someone to feel disgust, repulsed, objectionable. It's a deep-seated aversion. It's not just a case of dislike. It is a case of actual hatred. And maybe for the first time, you're catching a glimpse of something Jesus said, I hate it. It stirs and nauseates me. I despise it. It's actually in Jude, the little brother of Jesus, James and Jude. 
Jude said that there were a group of people that would come in and they would take the grace of God and turn it to lasciviousness. What were they doing that were so repulsed? The heart of God. Who were the Nicolaitans? I thought this was really, honestly, out of all my years, I've never studied who they were. I just see that name and I'm going, it just to try to pronounce it is a challenge. <laughs> the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. The <laughs> But it actually... It comes from a name, Nicholas, which in the Greek has two meanings. It is a compound word. Nico means conqueror, and laos means subdued people. When you put it together, it's one that conquers and subdues people. Nicolaitans, Nicholas. You'll find in Acts chapter 6 that they found their first challenge as a church and it was really a racial challenge it was over the Hellenistic Jews not being cared for the way they should be and the apostles were like listen we can't stop praying and preaching the word just to deal with all these issues pick out seven men full of faith or full of the spirit and wisdom pick you pick them out you've been watching them you've been observing them pick out those seven and we're going to lay hands on them we're going to we're going to send them out to be deacons and leaders out of that seven, one was named Stephen. What an amazing man. You read his story. He was one of, the, one of the first two martyrs, Stephen. But there was another man in there whose name was Nicholas. And according to Polycarp, who was a disciple of John and other historian writers, Nicholas, in his seat of power, ultimately fell. And here's how he fell. He started going into Ephesus and these other places and mixing, compromising, going in saying, we got to reach the pagans, so we're going to go in and act like the pagans, developed a doctrine that said the body is evil, the spirit is good. If, as long as your spirit is right with God, you can do anything you want to in the body, and God's okay with that. Come on, don't you go away right now. Live like you want to. Mix, compromise. It represented a compromising lifestyle that he was so seeker sensitive to the lost and the pagans that he was started eating the meat sacrificed to idols, started being known for his sexual prayers. Right, right. He became sexually immoral. He started teaching this into the church. Why do you think when Paul came back to the Jerusalem council and he looked at James and the other people and said, what do you want me to tell the Gentiles not to do? He said, we only give you two things. They're just two things. They don't have to keep the law of Moses to, because you don't earn salvation. But tell them don't eat meat sacrificed to idols and don't be sexually immoral. Yeah. Yeah. Just those two things. Why was that so important? Because Nicholas at this point had already been twisting and turning. It, it, it became a Gnostic view. This entire thing that holiness no, more, no longer matters to God. What we do, the moral code of God is nothing to us. We're not responsible to keep anything of the commandments of God. You just live like you want to. Get in, infiltrate the culture, be a part of the culture, live like you want to, and God's going to be okay with you and smile at you. Antinomianism was birthed out of this, which means anti-law. It was the belief that there was no moral laws God expects Christians to obey. A root system of Gnosticism. And Jesus said, watch, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. It was compromise. 
It was mixing the two. Compromise is simply changing the question to fit an answer. It's blending the quality of two different things. It is, means to dilute, to diminish the strength, the flavor, the brilliance by mixing it together. Little by little, compromise by compromise, you start lowering your standards and the changeover from truth to error, right to wrong, moral to sin starts taking place. It means negotiating, making concession. And Jesus hated compromise. He hates it. Why is that so important to us now? Why is it, why is it that he kind of recalled that back to them? After he had, he had given them all these compliments, and then he corrects them and says, but you've, you've let my love slip through your fingers. But you have this to your favor. You hate the compromisers, what they're doing. You don't hate them, but you hate their sin. See, you can love a sinner and hate the sin. But the moment we're, never, we're not willing to acknowledge sin, is the moment sinners are never delivered. Because there can be no godly sorrow. Because when we don't know we've broken the law of God, how will we ever know the blood of Jesus set us free to be saved? Well, I don't want to hear about sin. If you never know the things that break his heart, you will never be able to live in the things that bless his heart. Can I say that again? If, my God, guys, if you'd come, if we don't know the things that break his heart, we will never be able to live in a way to bless his heart. And why is it that Jesus would bring this to light like this? Because he wanted them to be victorious. He wanted them to be overcomers. Why is it so important now? Because we have been so numbed in this nation right now that without any backlash, a woman can put up a stripper pole at a Super Bowl. And we just laugh at it. And just think, and our children are sitting there watching that, and we think it's religious jargon for anybody to, you're just a religious fanatic. If you had any problem with that, then you got an issue. No, I'm telling you, Jesus was saying to the Ephesians, if you don't deal with comp, the thing you love and the thing I love, if you don't learn to hate what I hate, love what I love, it will take you out and strip your love from me. You will lose sight. We just become fuddy duddies. Look like fools. That women and men can parade themselves, touching themselves in front of our children, trying to just watch a game. Rick Renner says this today. We are seeing this under siege in the guise of inclusiveness. Morphing people into the moral climate of society, adjusting to fit in, which has produced another gospel and another Jesus. No more absolutes. And if embraced, this Nicolaitism produces a powerless, weakened version of Christianity where sin is tolerated, separation is ignored, and the need for ongoing repentance is disregarded. This is why Jesus hated the deeds and the doctrine. It repulsed him. But he promised them something. He said, if you'll just listen, If you listen to me, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, 
I will give him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That the end time believers are victorious in their love. Satisfied with the sustenance of his life and his presence. And that the only way you can fight this spirit of compromise is with an unrestrained love. First love. The one he called them back to when they first found him. Remember. Recall it. Repent. Return. The sensitivity he wanted them to walk in. Scripture says in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You say, I, you know, I, this is not a warm fuzzy for me. I'm so thankful. Because the church at Ephesus, they didn't get it right. With Paul being the founder, Timothy being the pastor and John the beloved reminding them constantly no one ever wrote of the love of God like John no one he was the only one that lived a long life bold in oil the scars of his love for him and now you go to Ephesus that church was removed off of its lampstand. There's nothing there. Because compromise ultimately. Instead of hating, and he said, you got this in your favor, you still hate what I hate. But if you don't deal with the first love, the spirit is working and compromise and mixing. Come out from a world and be ye separate, says the Lord. You say you're talking legalism now. I'm talking heart, man. Come on, I'm going to stand before God one day. If I don't tell you that part, I'm going to give a major account for that part. How will they know we're different? It's not about the principles of Jesus. Everybody wants the principles because there's a generation. They love knowing about him. They want to they pull truth from every little doctrine, from every little religion. Everybody's got it going on. It's a mixture. It's a, it's a compromise. And you say Jesus is the way, the truth in their life, and they laugh at you now because they're like, no, no one has absolute truth. you got to pull it from everything. But no, but we serve the one who is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And if I try to mix it with anything else, man, the spirit that took out Ephesus is taking out churches all over America. It's taking out pastors all over America. It's taking out families. It's okay, you can get away with this and how far can I get to the line, man? I, I don't want to live. If, if I, want, I, just, I just want... I just want to please you. I'm not saved by doing works. Now, the grace that showed up in our life, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But my friend, he didn't die for you to be overcome by what you came out of. He died for you to empower, to overcome it and live in victory for him to be your sustenance. I'm done. The church of Ephesus. What church do you belong to? I've had to look at my life. I just reveal any compromise in my life. Take me back to that first love. 
just when I was looking at that picture, those pictures of my precious wife and I remembered. He takes me back to do the things to remember to thank him. God, we praise you today. I thank you for every life in this room. Lord, today it's not even about responding to an altar. The greatest response we will ever make is the decision to turn from our ways and Lord, go home and live for you and serve you. If all we're relying on was a response years ago and just a prayer maybe we prayed, yet we ain't thought anything, we give no attention to it whatsoever any, since then. God, give us clarity today. Speak to every heart. Let us be a light, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. That the world looks and says, what is different about you? Lord, one day I will stand before you. I will give an account not for what I intended to do, but what I did do. Intentions are good, but not enough. Let my life, let our lives search to know you. Take us back. Don't let your love slip through our fingers. Take us back to remember, repent, return. Would you stand with me? Here's how I'm ending today. I know we have starting point classes, discipleship classes. We have next steps going on. We have, we have training and teaching that we're praying that it goes beyond just a Sunday gathering but he said go make disciples not Christians that's what he told us to do but it's not a numbers game to me I know you define things there's a whole book in the Bible called numbers there are things that God does count and I, I get that but one thing you cannot count and that is what is happening truly in the heart of someone else. I can't count that. But God knows. I pray we'll go out of here today and say, God, search me and try me. If there's a trip point, if there's a flaw of leaving my first love and how it affects me loving those around me, it wasn't just loving him was loving them. Show me what that is. If you need prayer, these altars are open today. We have, we have things ready. But I cannot spend my life as a pastor trying to convince people to do things they don't want to do. I'm 55. Flip it around, I'm 55. I got too many gray hair to do that anymore in my life. Here's the gospel. Here's the truth. Let's be the city set on a hill. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Amen. It'll affect how you see people at lunch today. Because see, you actually at the rock get lunch at a proper hour because you come to the first service. I'm almost keeping you to the second, but I'm about to dismiss you. Go out with joy. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you, give you peace, write his name on you. I pray you go find your place with God today. Get alone with him. I love you. Have a Jesus-filled day.